Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast of Australia. Good morning to everybody out in Western Australia and good evening if you're in the United States. I'm Simon Jackman, the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, Professor of Political Science here at the University as well. Um, welcome to another United States Studies webinar. Our first, is it post-election? It's not really post-election, I suppose, but our, our first webinar after election day and, and the wild well, a couple of days it's been since. Um, this is part of our regular uh, monthly co-hosted series of webinars with our, with our great friends and colleagues from the Perth US Asia Centre and I'm joined by their CEO Gordon Flake who I'll introduce in just a moment but as is customary for all our events um, I begin by acknowledging that the United States Studies Centre and the University of Sydney stands on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, part of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, in addition to Jeff uh, from uh, Western Australia, today we're thrilled to be joined by two great friends of the United States Studies Centre who are based in um, the United States, um, uh, Chelsea Martin. Uh, is, uh, is on the board of directors of the United States Study Centre, uh, more than just a good friend of the US Study Centre. Um, but she is also partner and managing director of the business advisory firm Bondi Partners. Uh, and Chelsea, of course, before this role, had over two decades uh, uh, working in the US-Australia bilateral relationship, um, spanning everything from international diplomacy, trade investment, and media and strategic communications, perhaps most prominently as Australia's consulate general, consul general, pardon me, in, in, in LA, um, uh, where big, big events like G'day LA and then later G'day USA were firmly in her remit, but a very busy part, landing part of the Australia US relationship ran through LA and anybody who's been certainly around the government to government relationship or business business relationship as knows about Chelsea and, and her great service to Australia through her stewardship of that part of the US Australia relationship. So delighted that Chelsea after government uh, continues that role, uh, though now in a much more sort of commercial, commercial frame. Fantastic. Um, and Jeffrey Blush uh, is with us as well. Jeff um, is a, um, affiliated with the Centre as an Honorary Research Associate, um, best known to us and everybody on this call, I suppose, as um, Ambassador of the United States to Australia during the Obama administration, um, uh, uh, where uh, Jeff uh, made many, many friends in Australia and uh, did great service to the national interests of both countries, frankly, in, in, in being such an effective uh, ambassador. Uh, during his spell down here in Canberra, where he, he still has a lot of friends in Australia. Um, but right now he's back in um, the United, United States, where he is now Chief Legal Officer at Cruise. Um, but, in, but prior to that, in addition to being ambassador, uh, he was special counsel to President Obama. He's been president of the State Bar in California. Uh, he's had big, big jobs at big international law firms. He's had, a, he's had special master roles in the US court systems and, um, and teachers um, now and then at, at Berkeley Law, but in particular back here, his academic connection in Australia, in addition to us here at the US Study Centre, is that he is the, uh, it lent his name and, and, and reputation and good insight and taste to the Jeff Blythe Centre for the US Alliance in Digital Technology, Security and Governance at Flinders University in Adelaide. Uh, terrific, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us um, on a Friday afternoon in Australia, a Thursday night in the US. And literally, we have asked our staff to alert us. I'm just looking over here at a monitor, should one of those states follow. Oh, just to dispense with this so we can get it out of the way, where are we? Um, Joe Biden is almost surely uh, going to win this election. If, as, you, as I do, I think Nevada is a safe call. At this point, at that point, that would mean Trump would have to win Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Um, uh, losing any one of those three states at this point would see him um, fall short of 270. Every other combination of those states sees Biden at 270 or better. Um, so indeed, uh, Jeff a., uh, and Chelsea, you may not be aware, but uh, one of Australia's, you can bet on anything in Australia, and one of Australia's leading betting agencies, Sportsbet, already paid out. Uh, on Biden, 
Uh, mind you, they also paid out on the Labor government uh, before the last federal election, a Labor government before the last federal election here in Australia. But anyway, um, as they say I wish in Australia... You told me that second part. <laughs> What's that? I said, I wish you hadn't told me that second part. <laughs> <laughs> um, it may be all over by the shouting, and shouting there is, and, and we'll talk about that perhaps in a moment. Um, where these legal challenges might be going. Jeff, that is firmly your neck of the woods, and I'll come to you for a bit of insight on that. But first of all, I want to come to Chelsea. With, look, with the results as read, massive voter turnout. Chelsea, I wanted, what should, what is some big picture takeaways Australia should take from, from this election, shaping up as a likely win, narrow win for Biden? But, you know, walk us through what else you're seeing in the election results and, and what they imply, first of all, for the US but then secondarily for Australia. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Simon, for having me. Thanks, um, everyone. It's great to be here. It's been quite quite the week. Um, and as you say, this election isn't actually over yet. Um, you're probably being more confident in calling it for, for Vice President Biden um, than we're seeing even some of the major networks being we've had on some of the major newspapers who've um, held off on calling Arizona in particular, um, mm -hmm. despite the fact that Fox called it on the night. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from this uh, for me is, you know, we've, we've, we're on track for the biggest voter turnout in a century in the United States. Now, that's a, that's a huge thing when we know that voter turnout is such a challenge um, in America. And it's also worth noting that, you know, Donald Trump won more votes last Tuesday than any Republican candidate for president has ever won. Um, you know, he's increased his vote from 2016 and, you know, the, the votes there must be more than the base that he was talking about. So the vote turnout for President Trump is significantly more than what polls were indicating. Um, and I think what that says is, you know, there is a strong support there for the message that he was saying. Now, that's an interesting, an interesting note, even if we are working on an assumption, Simon, that, that uh, Biden is going to get up because you've got a significant chunk of the American population who are either going to feel that that outcome is not legitimate or it doesn't represent um, anywhere what the direction they were heading in. Um, so the big challenge is going to be, if it is a Biden administration, how they bridge that gap and they bring this country together because clearly there's a significant divide. Um, we can probably delve in more detail as we go through this into the implications for Australia. Yeah. But, um, you know, frankly, I don't see that there will be significant implications for Australia. We've already got such a deeply entrenched bilateral relationship with such a key partner uh, for the United States. Um, I think the only thing I would say is that a new Biden administration is going to be heavily distracted. There's going to be a huge domestic agenda right off the bat, and I'm sure that Jeff has some insights into that. But, you know, a COVID relief bill, trying to do something to get COVID in some sense under control. I mean, we're seeing huge numbers here at the moment and it's almost, you know, not been discussed in the last couple of days that as we're going through this historic election and, um, you know, seeing this count play out, that those numbers of cases and deaths are continuing. Um, so I think just to set the scene that those would be my key takeaways from this week. Thanks, Charles. Um, Jeff, sort of similarly, if we could just kick off with some, you know, high level takeaways. And, and like I said, I think, I put a lot on Chelsea there, but let's let's perhaps table the uh, implications for Australia conversation. We can we can move move to that towards the, you know, as as we go along. Yeah, well, again, assuming it's a um, a Biden presidency, and that's and that's still very much an assumption. Um, I, I I think a couple things. <laughs> One is what we learned is that you know there was not a blue wave, there was not a landslide. We we're deeply deeply divided, but very animated which in some ways is very good for democracy because it means that people are paying attention, they care, and they're looking for solutions to real problems. And I think one of the problems in our politics has been that it has been gamed um, through special interests, through both sides. We've all been talking about um, challenges in our, in our political system for decades, but now you're seeing the public uh, really rising up with two very different views about where we're gonna go as a, as a nation. Um, and I think, you know, uh, by, by getting elected, Joe Biden has taken on a particularly hard challenge because he's got to forge a path which is not what has disaffected people from the Democratic Party in the past, um, but not the path that um, Donald Trump uh, adopted, which is very much not, a, not an American path. 
uh, and I'm happy to talk about what I mean by that um, further. The, the biggest challenge for Joe Biden now is that uh, he had expected that if he won, he would have the Senate and he would have a larger house and that would allow him to do a lot of deep structural things like HR1, which would change the, um, the, the way in which people are elected, um, uh, do a major infrastructure bill that would put a lot of people to work right away, um, and a number of things that would not require the assistance of Republicans. Um, now he's gonna have a very, very different challenge unless somehow they have a Hail Mary and they win the two um, Georgia Senate runoff seats, uh, which seems unlikely. But apart from that, he's gonna have to find a way to do something dramatic and innovative in a system where you know uh, the, the Senate will be trying to stop him at every turn. Uh, that's gonna be a major challenge for him. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll come to you on the on the legal challenges at some point too, just to get our conversation about the state of the race. But first of all, Gordon, um, perhaps same question, lead off question to you too. Um, your your takeouts uh, as a not just the the leader of the the Perth US Asia Centre, but a but a US citizen, <laughs> skin in the game. Well, Simon, it's an absolute delight to kind of partner with the United States Study Center again on this for the fifth month in a row. And, and boy, those five months went by quickly. Uh, it, it seems that they went by more quickly than the last 48 hours, which has been dragged on very slowly. Um, I have to say, I benefited tremendously from my mistakes in 2018. Uh, like many observers in the midterm election, uh, the much anticipated blue wave had not materialized. Uh, marquee races in, 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 in Texas and in Florida and Georgia went the other way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, things looked very different that evening than they did over the course of the week that followed. And, I, and that experience kind of steeled me for this, 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 you know, election itself with an expectation that votes on the day would be different, the process would take longer. One of the, my big picture observations is that it's striking that international observers have heaped praise upon the United States democracy in terms of how in the midst of a pandemic, uh, you know, this very cacophonous, you know, 50 state electoral process where everyone has their own thing and they had to figure out how they were gonna do it, what the process was. Election, the election itself went really smoothly. Uh, and even though the counting is, 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 is not as fast as we'd like it to be, the process continues to go remarkably smoothly without without interruption, without violence, and to the point where, again, international observers have praised the United States for the way it conducted the election. And yet, we saw just an hour ago, and on election night itself, the President of the United States, in turn, denigrating the United States. Uh, and that just tells you what a topsy-turvy world that we live in right now. Um, I, I kind of share your, your long-term optimism, and part of that is because of my home state of Arizona. Uh, where despite being sworn in as an Australian citizen in February, uh, due to the close relationship between our countries, I'm able to be a dual citizen and, and keep my foot in both camps. Uh, uh, and as, as we've discussed in this program before, uh, flakes have had an important role to play uh, in this election in Arizona. Uh, but I think Ambassador Bleich is right. It's not over yet. Uh, I have been struck with the, the tone uh, in, in Vice President Biden, the Democratic candidate who has been careful, has been measured, um, and I think in, in the long run, that will serve him and serve him the country well. Thanks, Gordon. And I, and I do want to come back to uh, theories about Arizona. We, we, can't, we can't not, with someone called Flake on the call, um, not get back to that. And indeed, with, with, with your cousin, Jeff Flake, being our guest, what was it, a month ago? Last, last month ago already, yeah. Oh, that, what a month. My goodness. Anyway, okay. Um, Chelsea, um, you spent a lot of your time as CG in LA, but thinking about public diplomacy, and 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 that is, you know, the the, <laughs> the battle for hearts and minds, as it's sometimes described. Um, Biden himself has talked about the distinction between the the example of American power versus the power of America's example, and I'm just thinking through both at an official level how Australia perhaps in government, but your sense of how Australians more broadly, the expat community that you're deeply enmeshed with there in LA, servicing all those years in LA, but, but perhaps more broadly, Charles, um, your takes on how you know, this deeply divided US 
the president of the United States, some of the things he's had to say about the process, how does that play around the world? And how does it play back in Australia where we often talk about putting values, you know, the shared values proposition as being so central uh, to the strength of the Australian US relationship? Well, that's a good question. And I think, you know, working again on the assumption of a, of a Biden administration coming in, I think you're going to see a pivot back towards that soft power diplomacy. And there's a lot of ground to make up there. Um, it's been a very different form of diplomacy under President Trump, very much led from the White House and from himself, um, you know, where it has been unpredictable. Um, and you've seen the United States retreat from a lot of those multilateral forums and, in fact, you know, regional forums and the like. So I think that that's something that will be uh, definitely something that will be of interest and relevance to Australia is seeing the United States re-engage in those multilateral um, forums. Um, and also, you know, moving away just from a defence-centric um, form of diplomacy and, and investing back in that. And I think if you look at it at a nuts and bolts level, of what it could mean for Australia is a greater US investment into aid, into, into some parts of our region, particularly where there's been COVID impacts. Um, so I think that in that sense, that will all be positive for Australia. Um, in terms of the broader narrative, I mean, you know, now that I'm outside of government, um, I can probably <laughs> comment on some of these things at, 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 a, at a deeper level, but you do, I do pick up a sense in Australia that there have been very strong reactions to this election. Um, there have been extremely high Australian engagement in the way the election has been conducted and the commentary. And I think it will be interesting down the track to have a look at Australian sentiments towards the US um, and, you know, ensuring that the, it's recognised the significance of that trade and investment relationship to Australia um, and doubling down on that. And I'm sure that, the, you know, the US State Department, Jeff, you'll probably have some insights into this, would have a strategy ready to go. Um Thanks, Chelsea. And I'll just, before I sort of ask the inverse question of Jeff, uh, recalling his time as ambassador, I'll just signal that, Chelsea, the US Study Centre is exactly sort of doing, engaged in some of that research right now. Um, we are doing, we're halfway through a study. We, we went into the field with some survey research pre-election. We'll go back to the same Australians and the same Americans after the inauguration um, of whoever the next president is. Um, to see if anything's changed on those matters. But early readout, um, Australians overwhelmingly um, wanted Biden to win this election. Um, um, even, and that, that holds up in every segment of Australian society, except supporters of, um, um, well, for, frankly, it's sort of the one nation, other, Qatar. You know, you've got to go out to that part of the electorate um, to find uh, where, where Trump was sort of preferred to Biden. Uh, it's true among the coalition, among coalition voters as well. Um, um, so that part of it is is quite clear um, for, for what it's worth. Um, but Jeff, um, I want to ask you about the conduct of <laughs> carrying the flag, as it were, uh, under different sort of diplomatic, under different political circumstances, back in back at home in the U.S. Does that make you know implications for diplomatic headway in a country like Australia? Say. Not that you were ever ambassador under W, of course, but, but you know, does the popularity of an American president affect public opinion internationally and then sort of have this sort of backdoor um, sort of enabling power for you representing American interests um, abroad? No, it, it definitely does. You know, there are, <clears throat> there are presidents who are more popular internationally um, than others. And, and if you're a, a diplomat, coming in with a popular president, it just um, um, uh, greases your way quite a bit. I remember um, during the 2008 election when um, US popularity worldwide had, had, had fallen significantly, you know, particularly with the global financial crisis and the Iraq war, um, Warren Buffett was asked um, how, how America recovers internationally. And he says, well, there are two different ways. One is uh, they're following seven treaties that we would need to uh, work on. We probably have to mend fences with the following countries. There would be an aid package, um, the whole complex set of moves. Or you know, you elect Barack Obama, and and you're good. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he he was right. I mean, uh, there was a there was a warm welcome back uh, to the United States at that point. I think it it may be a little bit more challenging this time, um, uh, simply because. Um, 
George W. Bush may have had, may have taken some policy choices that were unpopular, but in general, he believed very much in the uh, new world order um, and in liberal world order, um, was very strong on supporting alliances and, um, and sort of traditional ways of connecting nations, including, um, you know, free trade and fair trade agreements um, and focusing on things like human rights and establishing US values and rule of law more generally around the world. Um, that has not been the approach of, um, of President Trump. And so there has been some, um, some structural damage that's been done, as, as Chelsea said. There's you know, been, um, uh, among other things, just the unsigning of agreements, whether it's Paris Climate Accords or um, uh, unsigning the Trans-Pacific Partnership without, <laughs> without talking to the other partners of the TPP or trying to get any concessions for us and them from China uh, before doing so. Uh, and, uh, negative statements that were made about uh, regional and, and international fora um, not participating in them and, um, and criticizing partners and embracing uh, others, let alone issues like Ukraine and Kurds that we could, we could get into in terms of the sense of abandoning our partners who are in military conflicts, all of that. On the other hand, um, Joe Biden has a, you know, is really well known around the world. You know, he had, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's been around for 47 years. He had two terms as vice president. He served on the, um, you know, the, the, the Senate foreign policy, you know, committee, foreign, foreign affairs committee. So he, he knows, he, he, you know, he knows Xi Jinping very well. And um, he loves Australia and is well known to Australians and, and to um, allies and partners around the world. So I think he comes in um, already as a known quantity who can be trusted. I think one other point that I want to make and without going on too long is sure. that because he's going to have a potentially hostile Senate, he's going to have to look for those areas of common ground. And one area of true common ground remains foreign policy and particularly um, uh, trying to improve our position and the position of our friends and allies uh, in the Indo-Pacific and to um, have, a, have a strong but smart relationship with, um, with China. Um, uh, and so he'll be able to drive that kind of a policy and it may be an area where he focuses simply because other areas will be cut off for him. Got it. Look, I, I do want to sort of, <laughs> we're bouncing around a little bit. It's inevitable given the mix of expertise and, and backgrounds here. Um, but Gordon, I stole, I heard you, frankly, you put it back firmly in my mind. We were on air together yes, uh, <laughs> two days ago. Um, um, and, and that quote from Joe Biden about the example of our power contrasted with the power of example was one you made and we were on air together. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about sort of the implications of A, the conduct of the election, but B, the aftermath if there is a change in the presidency for American soft power and American standing abroad. Uh, interestingly, the, the Australian media debate in the last several months, I think has kind of missed it. Uh, they've tend to focus on who's better for Australia uh, and they, they've tended to focus on the bilateral and, and that really misses the, 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 what I think is a potentially seismic shift that's taking place if, as we assume, Joe Biden does win this election. Uh, and the reason is that the last three Australian governments, you know, Abbott and Turnbull and now, now Morrison, all deserve incredible credit for the way they have managed the relationship with the United States in extremely difficult circumstances. I'm hard pressed to identify any U.S. ally the globe over that has done as well. Uh, that has kind of avoided, if you will, the eye of sour and the negative attention and managed to hold things together. So my hat's off to our, our very able diplomats as well as, as, as the governments for how they've managed that. But that misses the broader picture. And that's the environment in which our alliance exists. Um, I, I've long believed that Australia has, in addition to its own very capable defense forces, two basic strategies for guaranteeing our national security in, in a, an uncertain world. And number one is an alliance partner with a powerful partner far away, originally the UK for the last 75 plus years, the United States. And the second has been reliance upon the rules-based order. Now that post-World War II liberal international, international system of laws, institutions, standards, norms, and agreements. And that's what really made Australia probably the globe's most full-throated advocate for multilateralism. 
Well, the last four years has seen a United States approach where America first has almost always meant America alone, where allies and alliances were denigrated, where multilateralism you know, was opposed, where again, and Jeff pointed out several very important examples where these agreements were pulled out from. So you know, that shift is the really important one. It isn't whether or not Australia and US are gonna be on the same page on climate change or you know, those individual bilateral issues. The bilateral, bilateral relationship is remarkably strong. The question is, you know, what are we gonna be doing together in the world uh, to advance our shared national interests? And that's where I remain remarkably optimistic and, and agree, I, I agree, agree very much with Jeff, uh, that that's one of these areas where Biden himself is gonna be inclined towards and Republicans in the Senate are gonna be inclined to cooperate with him on that front. Yeah, here, here Jeff, it's, um, it's an important point and, and one that you know, we at the US Study Center sort of amplify as well. You know, um, I think you're right. There's so much institutional ballast, I think, as Kim Beasley likes to say, in the in the in the US um, Australia relationship. And and indeed, when we're in Canberra, as you are, Gordon, you know, diplomats, public servants, the polys aren't too worried about the bilateral per se. It's the nature of US engagement in the region, and how the alliance, I think, is evolving to become a a, a vehicle. Uh, for advancing Australia's interest in, in a regionally engaged US and, and broadening the nature of that engagement away from things that are painted battleship grey and, and, and into, into those other domains. And um, point, point well said. Um, Jeff, I, while I'm going to jump back to US domestic matters, uh, taking advantage of your legal background, and, I, and I, I can imagine sort of many side conversations you're having with uh, Democratic uh, uh, friends uh, around the country. Um, I, I've long thought that Democrats needed to finally stop bringing a knife to a gunfight legally <laughs> after 2000. Seems like they're ready for something um, should that need be this time. But, but Jeff, your take on um, just the, the, the viability, the plausibility of, of uh, legal challenges in, in any of these close states um, getting up and perhaps disrupting kind of some of the council, uh, we, you know, Wisconsin and Michigan have, um, have, have Trump in front and Michigan's already moved the certification, but um, just your, your sense of the legal landscape as, a, as it pertains to the election outcome, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> we are, um, you know, we're very good in the United States of producing lawyers and litigation. So um, <laughs> it's not surprising that, it's in every aspect of our uh, uh, of, of our society, and including the you know election for president. Unfortunately, um, in this case, I think you're going to see a lot of litigation. Unfortunately, um, I had hoped that we might be able to forestall it, um, and one of the hopes had been that if there had been a um, early decisive result, uh, that would have um, prevented you know some narratives from being created that would suggest that somehow. Um, through litigation, you could uh, get the, you know, um, uh, get around um, uh, the issues of vote counting and everything else. Um, you know, would 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 just put those things to bed. Instead, on the evening of the election, um, President Trump came out and said he was going to the Supreme Court. Um, he came out today and made a number of statements suggesting that there has been widespread voter fraud and suppression and other things um, by the Democrats. Uh, and that that was um, the, the reason for his, um, uh, for, any, for any vote count that would suggest that he lost because he couldn't have lost. Um, I, I don't see any theories yet that are, that are particularly compelling. And if, um, if as I'm expecting, uh, uh, Joe Biden doesn't merely win in one state um, and get to 270, but actually takes Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, then at that point, it's very difficult to say that um, uh, the Supreme Court is going to invalidate all of those different states' resolutions, um, ignore the fact that the largest number of people in, in American history voted for uh, Joe Biden, um, and that he had been um, uh, otherwise identified as having won the electors. So. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's not a road that's likely to be successful, but it's one that this president will take. And we know 
<laughs> we know Donald Trump very well at this point. And, uh, and, and so when he says he's going to sue and he lawyers up, um, he's, he's going to sue with lots of lawyers. On the other hand, Democrats were prepared for this, have been anticipating it, have a really strong legal team, and I think we'll see that play out over the next several days. Um, so you are anticipating courts slowing down certification in, in, in key states? No, I'm not. I'm not anticipating um, courts slowing down certification. I'm anticipating a lot of lawsuits attempting to accomplish that. And um, I'm anticipating actions being um, brought by the president uh, before the Supreme Court. Chelsea, I wonder if you've got a, a view about <laughs> the atmospherics around the transition. Um, or moreover, you know, with your ear to the ground, um, perhaps up through the Bondi Partners channel, if you're hearing anything about sort of the state of mind uh, elsewhere, perhaps on the Republican side, um, does any, any, other, any other views on sort of the feasibility, plausibility of litigation? And if it fails, you know, are we on a smooth pathway uh, to, a, to a transition? Or is there, is there some card that, that Trump may, um, may play should he turn out to have uh, lost the election? Look, Simon, the one thing I can say confidently is he won't go quietly. Um, I think we already saw the tenor of that this evening. Um, we hadn't heard from the president direct to the media other, other than through Twitter for two days. And then he came out this afternoon in a press conference, which, you know, was a sign of things to come, in my view, where he is basically saying he's won the election um, if it was done on, on, you know, eligible votes. And so he's laying down that gauntlet. He is going to continue... I think, to, um, you know, pursue this legal course. Um, and I even think post-inauguration, uh, he'll continue to be a very noisy force um, in conservative politics and potentially um, even more so than he has been while he's been in the White House, where if there was any constraint on him, all of that will be gone. So um, I think Jeff's 100% uh, spot on that we will see this litigation. I hope that it won't actually delay results. I think that, you know, fundamentally, this is, this is a bit of a show. Um, but it does, it raises doubts in the minds of some parts of the electorate as to the legitimacy. And that's the, that goes back to the point we made right at the outset about the, significant, the significance of the vote uh, that Donald Trump attracted. Um, that is a huge number of people. Uh, he's got a very deep base, uh, but that, that goes broader than that. So I think that is a huge task for an incoming administration to try and navigate that. Um, really great audience question that I'll, I'll start filtering those into the conversation that picks up on that point, Chelsea. And I'd really like to have all three of us, uh, all three of you rather, uh, take, a, take a swing at it. This comes from Sonia, and Sonia asks, does 2020 demonstrate that 2016 was misunderstood, that Clinton's loss wasn't because, quote, people didn't like her, um, that Trump's win wasn't an aberration, but actually represented a previously unrecognized level of voter disaffection? Um, Jeff, how about you take a, a, a crack yeah. at that? 70 million people have voted for Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I think we knew there was a lot of voter disaffection in 2016. And, um, and, and I don't think you should underestimate the, the power of this, this election race, because it, it, as Jeff Blake said, because it dribbled in slowly, uh, the votes, um, people thought of it as, um, you know, very much like 2016 for Hillary, except, you know, just a few votes the other way. It's not, you know, you're, when you're running against an incumbent, um, we've only turned out three incumbents in the last hundred or so years of yeah. United States history. It's a very rare thing to not give a, a sitting president a second term. And in this case, um, taking back a number of large and important states from him, you know, if, if things go as we were discussing earlier, it would be Michigan, it would be Wisconsin, it would be Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, and the second uh, uh, congressional district, district in um, Nebraska. Nebraska. Which, yeah. Nebraska. Um, these are, you know, these are, these are, these are major shifts, particularly Arizona and Georgia haven't gone for Republican or for, for a Democrat in, you know, 30 years. So if you, if you take all those, um, all those pieces, what it says is it's a very different election. Um, but the, the depth of feeling among Americans uh, has only intensified over the last four years. 
Um, I think part of it is that Donald Trump himself um, intensified divisions. That was part of his part, part of his approach to governance was not to reach out and try and unify. It was to say you're either on my side or you're against America, um, and 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 divided us even uh, uh, further than we were in 2016. Um, so I, I I think we're you know we're in a different space than we were. I think the work is even harder for the next president than it was um, four years ago. Mm. On, on the other hand, um, I think the fact that Americans are so fired up on both sides um, means they're gonna, they're, they're gonna start demanding innovation that we haven't seen from our government in too long. And I'm actually optimistic that usually these periods of great pain and distress in American society um, though, though difficult while you're going through them, have produced a much stronger, better, and, and strangely more unified America uh, once you come through it. Um, Chelsea, do you, do you have a take on that? Um, I, 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 um, I appreciate Jeff's optimism. <laughs> I'm not sure I am as optimistic. Um, I wish I could be, um, um, but I'm, I'm wondering... Uh, if, if, if you've got a sense of it, or if Jeff's right, what would be a tangible sign um, of that coming together that, that, that Jeff's uh, alluding to? Maybe that's a question for Jeff, but, but I'll, put it on, I'll put it on you, Chelsea. Um, yes, I'll jump in there. Uh, I think <laughs> one of the things uh, to bear in mind in all of this is COVID. Um, and I think that if a new Biden administration can come in, and actually start to wrestle a little bit of control over that, including some national unity, which we have not seen. Um, you know, this is a very, very serious problem. We're heading into a third wave. You know, this is impacting every part of the economy as well. I think that that could be potentially a game changer. Um, I think it will be a huge challenge. Um, but on the broader, broader question, initial question about, you know, is this like 2016? I have to say, sitting there watching the results come in. At first, I thought it was a bit like 2016 because the polls yeah. were so wrong. Yep. Um, so I wouldn't, I think the, the, the mentality of the electorate is different right now. But I think one thing this election has shown us is that the old, the old system is gone. It is broken. Polling, at least the way it's done, is not getting to voter sentiment. I think the Republican Party will have a lot of thinking to do about, you know, its future. Um, and I think that where all of that goes will depend on just how um, much of a distraction or a disruptor Donald Trump can be um, in the next phase. Gordon, did you want to get on get in on this? Add on that, and if, if it's possible to be even a little bit more optimistic uh, that, that, than Jeff on this front. Uh, so much of the narrative for the last 48 hours has been how in the world did 70 million American voters look at the chaos of the last four years, the, the COVID-19, 240,000 deaths, and say, yeah, we want four more years of this. Uh, and, and actually, I, I tend to, be, you know, to, to look at it a slightly different way. Uh, again, as I mentioned at the outset, had the Republican legislators in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania not deliberately forbade the counting of votes before the election, right? And we had the results that I think we ultimately will end up with which is Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, and, and, uh, was, and Michigan, announced on the night, and then maybe even Georgia, the narrative we're having right now would not be about division. Uh, we probably, once the votes are counted, you know, Biden will probably by win by close to 5 million votes. Sure. You know, and so again, this is, a, this is a, again, there have been two elections in the last 20 years that are closer than that. So it's not nearly as divided as people think. And more importantly, that was, again, to, to, to build on what Jeff was saying, despite the tremendous powers of incumbency used more aggressively by this president than any president in my memory. In other words, the, the narrative, the fact that, that the overwhelming majority of Trump voters believed that the COVID problem has been solved, believed that the economy is better today than it was at the end of Obama, when, you know, data you know, shows that you know, more jobs were created during the last three years of Obama during the, than the first three years of Trump. And that was before the COVID collapse, right? There's just this, this fundamental disconnect. And that's a disconnect because the president used and abused the full power of, 
of this of his ability to drive the narrative every single day uh, and, and then the powers of the state to prevent any other kind of alternative view going to his viewers and so i believe firmly in the power of of, of transparency the power of daylight uh, and i anticipate that if uh biden does indeed you know, win this election that you're, one of the things that you're going to see quite dramatic is one uh, a rapidly diminished you know, megaphone in the hands of the president. He even saw an hour ago, Twitter has, had put out a statement that says, once he's no longer president, you know, Donald Trump will be you know, bound by the same rules of Twitter as the rest of the world. In other words, he tweets like that again, he'll get cut off, right? So there's a lot of interesting things going on that will happen. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I think there's, um, there, there's re reason to believe that we'll find uh, pathway to unity. And I can't think of any of the candidates that were in that very impressive field of Democrats that's better positioned to do that than Joe Biden. That's just his demeanor. That's his experience. May not have been as exciting to some on the far left, but that's that's what he did in Washington. So, um, And Gordon, I would just jump in on that as well. I think another factor, because you, you pecked me up now with all that optimism, but one thing we didn't mention <laughs> before is that, you know, a factor in this election, which we all need to bear in mind is that huge early vote, like the fact that that has now, you know, in a sense, slowed things down, but also allowed this sort of greater engagement. But that, you know, we're looking at the division and we're looking at the time it's taking, but that is actually just a huge phenomenon that needs to be taken into account too. 100 million votes um, ahead of actual election day. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, when sorry, I- go ahead, when, Jeff. <laughs> when I was an optimist before, I just want to give a couple of historical reference points, you know, McCarthyism. Um, 1968, uh, the uh, uh, 1920s when we had anarchists and we had, you know, um, some of our, our, our most fraught and violent um, uh, politics ever. And then, of course, the Civil War. Um, you know, these are all periods during which Americans just um, it seemed to have irreconcilable differences. And then we have come together. Uh, I think if we if we just take the long view, we understand that typically it's because something fundamental is happening in our society. Major economic dislocations, changes in media and the way we communicate with each other, um, you know, movements of, you know, of, you know, dramatic demographic shifts, all those things, whenever they happen, this is what we do to each other. Um, and as long as we stay true to some basic American values, we come out of it and we come out of it stronger. Well, so I'm not just Pollyannish. I, 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 and the specificity is welcome and, and indeed um, um, reminding people that, you know, uh, those, you know, is, is to be an adult at the time of 1968, you know, means you're, 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 you're 70 years old um, if you're 18 in 1968. And so, um, um, but um, it's an important historical reference point um, that not so long ago, the US was going through things far, far, far worse than, than what we saw uh, in terms of disorder and violence uh, in the streets. Um, um, and, and, and the good news, I think, is we've seen nothing like that around the election um, uh, thus far, uh, at least, uh, which, is, which is a great thing too. And, and Gordon, for the record, we're at um, Trump's, Trump's lead, uh, Biden's lead right now is 4 million votes with California has only counted 75% of its vote. That's gonna blow right out uh, that'll be a six million, six and a half million plurality, I think, by the time we're done. Um, um, in, in one of the things about 2016, that slow counting of the vote in California just, and it was all, <laughs> it just kept pushing Hillary Clinton's popular vote margin out and just sort of putting the Electoral College result into sort of um, ever mean. more. <laughs> ever more contrast, yeah. It's worth noting that, presuming that Chelsea is still uh, in, in California as well. That this is one of these rare panels where we've got three people on the west coast yeah and, and only one on the east coast and so what we're really waiting for is these west coast results uh, well well okay gordon let, let let's do that. let's talk about arizona buddy uh um so and and i do want to tap into sort of your deep knowledge um of, of of the desert southwest and its politics um real briefly for an australian ones we're going a little deep here but when you think arizona you think, I think, um, I think, I think Senator uh, Goldwater, I think um, the, the founding of sort of American conservatism, as we know it, the desert Southwest, free spirited, libertarian uh, in its outlook, 
Um, and then I also think more recently, John McCain. Uh, and, and, and then even more recently, I think about your cousin, Senator Jeff Flake, um, um, uh, opposing Trump on a few things, Trump coming after him in his primary, uh, kind of ending, frankly, uh, uh, Senator Flake's uh, career in the US Senate. And now Arizona appears, appears, and still highly provisional, but seems to be on track to be joining that procession of states in that part of the country. Over my time in the United States, uh, 1990 to 2015, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Obama won it twice. And now it looks like Arizona, post the first election after the death of, 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 of John McCain, uh, might, be, might be going that way. Uh, your sense of, of what's going on there, is it demographics? Is it McCain slash flake specific? Um, is it the fact that it's a border state and there's a Latino population there? I mean, just give us a, a quick sense of that. Well, Simon, from your 20 plus years at Stanford, you'll actually understand this uh, better than most. But Arizona is a very interesting microcosm through which to view the overall election. And that is, uh, there is a broad demographic change taking place in America. Um, and part of what we're seeing in terms of this very stark divide in which Donald Trump, rather than, than soothe, has exploited, not only four years ago, but again this time, is anxiety around an older, wider Protestant population who's uncomfortable with the changing demographics of America. And so what you see is in urban areas on the, the East Coast, but most recently on the West Coast, is, as California became majority minority, as you look at the other Western Coast states, you look at Nevada, you look at New Mexico, they're almost permanently shifting into the Democratic camp, given the changing demographics of those societies. Most people assumed uh, that Arizona was still probably two cycles away from becoming like California or New Mexico, just on demographics alone. Uh, there's several things that have happened. Um, insanely expensive house prices in California, and Jeff will know that, you know, have pushed a lot of Californians into Arizona, as well as a lot more Hispanics. You also have, you know, I was born and raised a 1% white minority in the middle of America on a Native American reservation. Uh, and they're listed on most TV polls as something else, but in Arizona, they really matter. Uh, there are religious issues there. there. There's been a lot of media about my own faith, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons talking about the Mormon wall in, in Arizona, who women in particular have rejected. When you put that all together and you overlay that with the ghost of John McCain, you know, it, 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 it results in, in a turning of the election two cycles earlier than you would naturally expect it to be. Um, I did see several interesting comments that you know, it, it, President Trump had these very strange personal vendettas against John Lewis, you know, and against John McCain, two people who were broadly revered on a bipartisan basis in the United States. Uh, and if you look at both Georgia and Arizona, it does seem that the, there's a bit of a karma taking place between the, these two states in the course of the election. Um, just a bit of detail. I actually, as much as I exulted in the, the early Fox News call, I think Fox probably called Arizona a little bit too early. Uh, there's about 260,000 votes left to be counted in Arizona. Of those, uh, 200,000 are from Maricopa County. Uh, in the last batch that was dropped just about an hour ago, uh, Trump is winning those by about 14 percentage points. Mm -hmm. If with the remaining votes he's going to overtake Biden, he's going to need to win by 18 percentage votes. But it's really close. We're down to, yeah. to 46,000 votes of, of a margin. Uh, so ironically, I think Pennsylvania and Michigan are gonna provide much larger margins uh, for Biden than Arizona. I'm still pretty optimistic looking at the lay of the land. And I think those people who dig down into the county by county, whether it's Maricopa or Pima or Pino County are, are still optimistic that that lead will hold. But I, candidly, I think for democracy and for the country, uh, all hats off to Fox News for making that call early. <laughs> what it did is it changed the narrative and it prevented the president from doing what he wanted to do, which is standing up the night of, and not just ramblingly so, but formally declaring victory based mm -hmm. on those results. Uh, and it basically just had everybody slow down and take a breath. Uh, and in the end, I think that's gonna be a useful thing. Um, Jeff, I'm just wondering if, again, your, your connection to democratic politics, um, 
I, and I should have done this at the top. I, I gave my read of the race from here in Sydney, but I, I guess, you know, your read of the race, I mean, this assessment that, you know, Arizona might flip, uh, we might see a lead change there. Um, what, what's your sense of how, how this is going to wind up? Um, no, I, I think I'm where Jeff Flake is on it, which is uh, it is going to be tighter than, than people anticipated. But I do think that if you just look at the numbers, particularly Pima County, which is um, uh, a much, much more heavily Biden um, uh, area, I think that will start to reverse this trend of, you know, big chunks coming off of the, of the Biden lead. But regardless, you know, the, 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 point is what's most important for I think Democrats to understand is for the first time in a long time um, they they are highly competitive in Arizona they are highly competitive in Texas they are highly competitive in Georgia um, mm -hmm. and um, whatever whatever the combination of states is that might put Joe Biden over the top um, that that competitive opportunity isn't going away. And it's something that Democrats really need to focus on uh, because demographics have shifted um, and um, people who were promised a lot by Democrats up North have been <laughs> frustrated and people who've been promised a lot by Republicans down South are frustrated and are looking for alternatives. Um, Jeff and, and Chelsea, um, um, do Democrats have to be disappointed with the result? I mean, it's not the, you said at the top, Jeff, it, it, it's not the blue wave. Um, tons of money was thrown against Senate incumbents, Republican Senate incumbents. Susan Collins was gone for money and has walked it in. Lindsey Graham has, you know, has shrugged off the most expensive, actually, I think it turns out to be the, the second most expensive because in North Carolina, I think turns out to be the most expensive Senate race in history. And, and there's been a net shift Dems de down um, one in Alabama, which they're always going to lose, but only two pickups. Arizona, uh, or at least we think um, Arizona, and, and Colorado, right? And, and they're in that bucket of states. Um, um, there's been some speculation, and it's, and it's based really on the exit poll, and polls are sort of a dirty word at the moment, but, um, but, um, but Trump did very well with minorities, at least r historically, relative to, to past cycles. I've seen one piece of data that suggests uh, one in five African American men voted for Obama. He, Obama did 80 20. Uh, Biden did 80 20 among African American men. Um, um, the Miami Dade story um, is, is, you know, Biden has trailed Hillary Clinton there by about 10 to 15 points or something like that. It's, it's double digits. Is there a, a rationalization? I mean, uh, for that performance, and in particular, a story that we've told about the minority, the non-white share of the electorate being this deep, deep, when turnout goes this high, um, you know, I would have thought uh, 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 on, on the back of record-breaking turnout, that's got to be a huge cycle for Dems, but it hasn't been. So look, the, 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 the number one lesson that will be taken from the Democratic Party from this election is they paid way too much for pollsters. Um, they just, got, they did not get their money's worth. Um, and, um, and, and so I think there's um, an understanding that their belief that um, um, either antagonism towards Donald Trump um, or, you know, their, um, their ability to, you know, hammer on an issue where they were, you know, the party of science and, and could be trusted and facts in a, in a period of, of of great unease um, and anxiety um, wasn't enough. Um, and that they need to come up with a whole new set of policies and a whole new way of talking to people. What Donald Trump did very effectively was he convinced them um, that he was independent of both parties um, and that they could rely that he was being himself, that he wasn't saying something that a pollster told him, that a consultant told him or anything else. Um, I think Democrats need to take a lesson from that. And that means not only come up with new policies, but a new way of communicating, which isn't poll driven, that isn't consultant driven, that doesn't sound like, you know, the, the back room scenes on Veep, <laughs> where people are whispering in the ear of, you know, how are you going to talk to this demographic? And all the things you were just describing, which is what we're trying to get 
you know, this group or that group or that, you know, just say what you actually believe um, and connect with people at that level. I think that will be an important lesson that Democrats will hopefully take from this whole experience. Chelsea? Mm -hmm. um, I'd agree, Jeff. I think one of the differentiations between the, the campaigns was that Donald Trump had some real cut through messaging, which you can see if you talk about Miami Day, like the messaging around, well, you can't vote for Joe Biden, he's a socialist. Like he just, they hammered it home in particular segments of the, where they knew that that would have cut through. Um, I think you saw the same thing around oil and energy um, where that was particularly targeted. And it's one of the things that Trump is masterful at. He gets one line and he just rams it home. Um, and I think, you know, ab above and beyond the message, it's about understanding those voters that you're talking to. Um, and I think that, you know, that is something that clearly Donald Trump did very well in this election. Um, I think the other, the other thing I'd take away, just looking at the election, you know, as an observer, is this was a very, very different election. You basically did not have Joe Biden out on the, on the hustings until right at the end, I mean, because of COVID. But you did have Donald Trump out there really physically rallying up his, his base, particularly those last sort of 12 days where he was doing five, six, seven rallies a day. And I don't think you can take away from the impact and the momentum that that had, um, you know, ignoring the, the polls that Biden was so far ahead and just leaning in um, to his base and bringing that energy. Um, that was interesting. And I don't think that the Democrats could have done it differently. I honestly don't, um, just because of the circumstances, but it is, it is a point of difference in the way that the election campaigns were run. Hey, we're running out of time. Um, so I wanna, I can't let the hour finish without getting to a, um, a foreign policy question. So we'll put a line under the US domestic stuff, kinda, <laughs> it's all related um, for a second. But the, look, the single biggest bilateral in the world right now is US China. As government to government conversations between Australia and the US sort of go China, China, China. Um, and if they don't get there in the first 90 seconds, once they get there, they stay there. Um, differences in China policy under a second Trump administration versus a Biden administration. V very curious, your read, all three of you actually, but we haven't got a ton of time. So these will probably have to be hot takes if you don't mind. Ambassador Blige, we'll start with you. Okay, two, two very different approaches. Um, Donald Trump was, was, is a transactional person. Um, it's all one-off bilateral relationship and what's in it for me. Um, China actually liked him um, because they knew him. They're transactional too, and they don't care about human rights. He doesn't care about human rights. And they also thought he wasn't particularly adept at uh, these sort of transactional negotiations, at least in the world of statecraft. He maybe he was good at real estate in New York, but he, was, he had not been a student of statecraft. And they felt they were running circles around him, distracted him, and able to do a number of things that are very dangerous for um, the United States long-term national security and security of our allies. Things like the Belt and Road Initiative, which allowed them to lay infrastructure and, um, and uh, accumulate debt um, um, among hostage countries, uh, which they can use either threat or debt later uh, to bring those countries into line. Similarly, things like 5G, establishing surveillance states and being able to, again, impose their will on their own people and, and people in the region. Um, so that was not where Donald Trump was focused on. He was focused on, can I get a deal? where I can show people that I was tough on China um, and missed a bigger picture. I think you're gonna see a very different kind of approach from a, uh, from, from a President Biden. Thanks, Jeff. Chels? Look, I don't doubt that we will definitely see a different approach, but my takeaway is that we won't see a significant change in the strategic posture. Um, in terms of particularly around tariffs. So, uh, you know, the campaign's tagline with China was confront where we must cooperate where we can. So I think you're going to see a much more nuanced um, balance there. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see walking away from um, some of the, the, the efforts to confront China where the US feels they need to. Fantastic. And Gordon, absolute last word from you. Very brief. Um, um... Too often in Canberra and elsewhere in the region, we tend to think about our policy towards China without paying enough attention to what's happened there. So a uh, Biden mm -hmm. policy towards China will be driven more by the changing nature of the Chinese state. Um, there is one very important difference, however, 
Uh, and that is what I talked about earlier. Uh, I mean, the real strength of America has been its system of alliances, uh, the strength of the international system. And so uh, the, the Trump approach towards China has been all attitude and no strategy. I anticipate a Biden approach will be a little bit more nuanced. They'll want to cooperate on health. They'll want to cooperate on climate change, but they will leverage the tools that have traditionally been the real strength of the United States as allies in the international system and, and thus have a more effective policy. But ultimately, you know, there, there is a fundamentally different reality in China today than there was when Joe Biden was vice president. That'll have to be the last word. We've gone past uh, the top of the hour. Um, easy to do. There is so much going on and so much of it with implications for Australia. Um, I, I cannot tell you, guys, or Jeff, you won't be surprised by this. The level of Australian interest in this election is just off the charts. All the major networks here went day long. The more TV, live TV time spent on covering this election than you would on an Australian election. Uh, that's an absolute fact. Uh, it's just remarkable. Um, testament to the level of interest. And to, to all the people who are sending in questions, I wasn't acknowledging you particularly often, but trust, rest assured, I was synthesizing all the questions in, in what I was putting to the panel as we went along. So thank you to so many people. Some of you are regulars. I recognize you from, from webinars that we've been running all year long. Thank you so much for continuing to stick with us. Uh, the election isn't over. So <laughs> thank you so much for your continued interest and support of the US Study Center and of the Perth US Asia Center. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Simon. Much Thank appreciated. You, Simon. Thanks. Thanks stay much. well, stay healthy over there in the United States, and, and we'll see you soon for another webinar shortly. Thanks, everybody. Bye.